Okay, well here we are today at the legendary Mark Grau Studios. I'm very honoured to be with you, sir. I'm honoured that you came up here. It's yeah. wonderful. Well, here All the way up to five. In so Burbank, long, California. Yes, that's true. You should let people know where it is. Well, yeah, it is in Burbank, California. That's it right. Is. We're in Burbank, California. Okay, and that's what the nice lady on the Tom Tom told us, so we believed her. So here we are, not in some alien third dimension or fourth dimension. It is a voiceover studio, so it's close. <laughs> it's close. Well, we just uh, had a very nice chat, Mark, and uh, what I wanted to ask you just to kick off here was, uh, this is the legendary Mark Brown studio. Was there ever a time when you weren't legendary? And, and what was life like uh, as a kid? How, how did you get into this crazy business? Well, I have an ex-wife and children who wouldn't think it was legendary at all. Uh -huh. so, no, I, I actually, um, it's very interesting. I was born into this, basically. My dad used to anchor news at Channel 5 here in town, KTLA. So I grew up with Daz Butler and Stan Freeberg doing a puppet show live, oh. um, which is very interesting. They, at that point, didn't have actual lighting systems. This was back, well, my dad started there in 1948. I'm not that old. Um, but as a kid growing up, would go in and sit and watch this. And the lighting systems that they had at that point were simply huge pieces of plywood with uh, floodlights mm -hmm. just patched all to it. So <laughs> it must have been 300 degrees back there. I have <laughs> fond memories of sitting there with my mother, watching this wonderful series, this live puppet show, and Stan Freeberg goes, hey, Beanie Boy, oh, fuck, like this, and the puppet had literally melted on his head. <laughs> and so I thought it was wonderful because that was the day I learned puppetry and bad words. And, and it didn't go royal with my mother at all. She said, you're not going back there. So, um, but we used to mimic voices. Uh, there was a drive-in, an A&W drive-in that I would say that with my brother and mimic people eating and, and kind of do voices with that. Um, it's funny, kind of a circuitous route. I ended up being the staff announcer at Channel 5 for about four years, which was interesting, which was kind of a strange thing after my dad being there. So, you know, it was, you know. So, was that your first job? Or? No, actually, my first job, I, I uh, got, uh, went to college and got an, an Associate of Arts in Broadcasting and thought, well, every radio station in the country will want me, and of course they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked all over Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Oregon, Washington, San Francisco, San Diego, um, went to San Diego State as well, got a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in Communications, still nothing. Um, but uh, always, my first love was always production. And so when I kind of lied my way into a music studio up here. It was actually Cherokee recording, large, large, I mean, this was a, the heyday of Roy Thomas Baker, who was the one who, he produced the Cars, Journey, you know, I mean, I, you know, it was a, a magnificent studio. I really was kind of in over my head, however, they had a media studio, and so I was in charge of that. So my first big gig was Van Halen, and not musically, but actually to produce commercials for. And I had talked Warner Brothers into coming in. And when they came in, they brought their own engineer. They had all the girls that looked like they're dead. It was black fingernail <laughs> polish, black you know okay. lipstick, black hair, black everything. So uh, the guy was looking to patch an effect. And I go, well, you know, if you do this, and he turns around in front of this room full of people and goes, you know, I'd appreciate it if you shut your mouth and stay out of this. And it was kind of... You know, right side of the brain wanted to knock him off the chair, left side uh -huh. just kind of sat there and turned four shades of red. So I thankfully went with the color portion and uh, listened to the spot afterwards and was, and this was high priced talent. I mean, it was a big deal. And I was very nervous the fact that I had had Warner Brothers Records in. And listened to the spot and went, it's okay, but I think I can probably do something. So I actually went in and voiced, not vocally, but production again, that was always my fun. So I actually went in and voiced it because I could pay someone to do it and tacked that on the end of stuff when I sent it to Warner Brothers Records. They called up and said, what the hell is this? And I was like, I, I apologize, I didn't mean anything. No, 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 we liked it. It was like, really? What? They liked me. You know, it was the first foray into that. Um, and so I had Warner Brothers Records for about 19 years until uh, AOL bought them out. And that was kind of what started. So, so, you, so you started working with another studio, and at that stage you'd set up your own studio. Yeah, what happened in that case was uh, they ended up closing that out because they realized they could make more music, uh, money as a music studio, mm -hmm. doing sweetening and that kind of stuff. So I actually bought Studio 5 from them. I had not a penny to my name. Um, I was living in a guest house behind a Yugoslavian landlord okay. in East Hollywood who would come out and go, Mark, I don't care what, what are you doing in my house? I don't your cut shut my yard, Mark. So um, he, it was kind of an interesting thing because literally half the guest house was a studio, which I had bought from Cherokee and, and stuck it in there. And uh, 
things just kind of progressed. It was a very interesting, you know, kind of a, a, a place, obviously, having all this stuff and trying to keep things going. Mm -hmm. um, moved from there into a commercial building in Hollywood. This has been, goodness, probably 35, four, 35 years ago. And uh, just gradually expanded there. We started with about 600 square feet, then doubled in size, tripled in size, quadrupled in size. And then it got to the point there was a lot of uh, interesting individuals in the neighborhood. And let's just say that it was like, Whoa, that's not a woman. Okay. <laughs> okay so, yes. yes, it was rather interesting. Oh, okay. So, yes, and you didn't want to laugh because terrible things could probably happen to you. So, uh, but the, the neighborhood was pretty rough. I remember uh, having Julie Andrews come to a session. <laughs> She's walking in very prim and proper, and across the street, you've got, say it, bitch! I mean, it was like, <laughs> oh, my Lord. I was mortified. Um, thankfully, she was very classy and just acted like nothing had happened yes. whatsoever. But I was like, uh, you know. <laughs> and so... Uh, Anyway, things got a little rough there, so I actually looked around and moved out here uh, about 28 years ago into this building. It was very interesting. This was a company called Stereo Vision, and this was a company that did all the really cheesy-looking guerrilla 3D movies back in the 50s and 60s. So when you walked in, there was a very old man that was like, here, let, let me show you, and there's and the dust would fly all over the place, and he had like little rocket ships on strings and things. It was kind of interesting. Um, but it basically built the place up and just kind of started out with that. They had uh, done a lot of audio books to begin with. I literally, I bet we've probably done close to 8,000 titles. They started out with Dev Audio, which was very instrumental because we were kind of the studio. They did a lot of stuff. And then literally within a week after opening here, they said, well, we built our own studio. And it was like, <laughs> I'll be okay. So, you know, it's, it's been kind of that progressive change of stuff. And now um, it's, I think, you know, the legendary portion simply comes from the fact that if we've been, we're still Figure upright. <laughs> that's, that's all that is. It's like, yes. oh, look, he's still alive. Yes. You know, so. <laughs> so you've, uh, talking with you, uh, you've obviously got thousands of characters locked up inside you, just screaming to get out, some of them. Um, was Why your, are you was your, like <laughs> yes. I feel safe, I'm over here. I've got an armrest <laughs> between me. Um, but that's not all of your work. But did you start off with the more character side of stuff or the narrative stuff or did you just grab whatever came along? How, how did you create? Well, the funny thing is I've always done voice work. I was, again, a disc jockey and radio, but the door would fly open and the general manager would go, Mike, I can't believe you just said that about the Chevy dealers. Now apologize on the air. I was like, okay. And I would do the character stuff on the air and stuff. But this was way before the Mark and Brian's and Howard Stern's and stuff. So that didn't necessarily go over really well, especially in a market like Wyoming. Imagine that. And so the character stuff is what, what actually I did was started the studio first as the bread and butter portion, knowing that that, that was the business aspect of stuff. Um, the first, uh, I did a lot of voice work, but the first actual audition I had was at Hanna-Barbera. This was when Gordon Hunt was back there. In fact, I think his assistant, I think it was uh, Chris Zimmerman. And uh, it was a, a daunting, I had no idea how it worked. So I had written this entire script thinking that you needed to do a Robin Williams changing, so it was like, now we'll have to find the great knower of stuff. You may call me great, great, yes, one great is enough. Okay, then, uh, you, you know, they, they were like, make him stop. <laughs> it was, uh, was like, no, I swear I'm not on crack. You know, just, just caffeine. Um, so that portion of is, is kind of where that, that started. Most of the stuff I was initially doing was the character stuff, yeah. You know, cartoons and video games and all that kind of stuff. And then that branched out in... You know, with the deeper pipes, I was doing a lot of that. You know, tonight on CNN. You know, all that kind of Anderson Cooper stuff and all of that. And and yeah, it's it's uh, gone into the narration portion as well. And it's it's kind of across the board. I mean, it's it's an interesting. I've, in that case, I've been very fortunate. I don't think anybody's actually figured out what I do, which is probably why I still get to work. Yeah. <laughs> so just by being creative and pushing pushing on doors and. Seizing the opportunity. Well, yeah, absolutely, and it's very much it's it's you adapting to what the situation is. It's not the other way around. A client will not adapt to you. You're there to serve them, basically. So if they say they want a gay Jamaican coffee cup, that better be one of your characters. That's what you need to do. You can't go well. That's that's not one of the characters I developed. It's very much improv. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people it's like that's the best possible class you could take is an improv class. Um, if you've ever called the boss and lied to him about why you're late to work, that's improv. And if he believed it, it's good improv. And that, okay. that really is the key. Well, the key, too, demo-wise, when people do that, yes. it's like if you do, 
uh, animation and, and you want to do cartoon characters, it's like be realistic with yourself. You don't need to do everything. Mm -hmm. you know. And it's like it's much better. Don't fall into quantity versus quality. I love people who go, well, I've got 741 voices on my demo. It's like, and it sounds like you're doing every one of them. <laughs> yes. you know? So yeah, just you know, do three, four, just do, do what you do. I mean, it's, it's the, the people that are, it's like you've found that slice and you, and you do that, but just a notch better than the next person. That's all it is. And don't take it too seriously. I mean, you have to understand we're sitting in a room and talking, and yes, there is absolutely the business aspect of this, and people miss that sometimes. But on the other hand, realize that we are getting paid to sit in a room and talk, which is yeah, like, how, yeah. how cool is that? And um, we were joking a little bit earlier about how no, some no, people... No, we weren't. No, okay. It we was were no being very serious <laughs> earlier uh, about how people take their, train, their training too seriously. And mm -hmm. how training, some sort of input, whether that's input from the world around you or input from the class, some sort of input is important, but taking it to... Well, I think, I think you can learn technical aspects of things and that's wonderful but the bottom line is if you're in a session whether it be whether you're recording your demo whether you're actually getting a call back or you're auditioning for something or you've booked the job you don't have the luck you're not sitting in there going now I remember that when I hit this phrase I'm supposed to use my diaphragm yeah, okay. and down like this and then on this I'm going to do this and no it's basically you just do it and fly with it that and then Really, the biggest thing of all to be successful doing this is your ability to interpret whatever the director says. Sure. And sometimes you're going to be kind of going, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. And other times you'll be going, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. No, no. You'll have directors that are very good and will make perfect sense, and those are the good directors that kind of bring you over to the dark side, and then they set it up and you just fly with it. And there's others that, that uh, their style can be very, uh, you know, kind of aggressive which doesn't necessarily, I don't think that's conducive to getting a great performance because you kind of freeze a little bit. Um, so, you know, again, it's just, it's, it's doing what you do. If, you know, if, if bring to it what you do. Don't stop in a session and go, oh, I, no, I don't know. It's like have that visual image mm -hmm. of what it is. I know I've driven a Buick, so I can't do a voiceover for <laughs> Yeah, ex exactly. Yes. I mean, it, yes, it's not what, yeah, exactly. But it's one of those things, it's like do what you do. It's, it's like if you have a younger voice that's kind of that young hip thing where you're going to be doing a Toyota Prius spot, not a Lexus or Infiniti or Mercedes Benz. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's skewing to what you do kind of a thing. Um, and it's also that visualization. It's like, is it elegant? Is, are you walking down you know, in a tuxedo or a woman in an evening gown at a museum with a, a, a glass of champagne? Or is it more, no, I'm wearing a pair of cutoffs and in the backyard with a beer? You know, it's kind of, you know, are you, you know, BSing with the boys and back talking about how crazy your girlfriend is because she took your car down to this, uh, you know, car mechanic that's an idiot? You know, so that's a little more blue collar, mm -hmm. average mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, if I see another piece of company that's, we want an average person, we don't want an actor, we want a real person. It's, uh, but no acting, we want yes. real. I've never been real, so how yeah, can I do that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, you know. So, I mean, obviously, you enjoy the creativity of the, the characterizations and so on. Um, uh, and so on, but also you're doing the narrative reads, I guess, some corporate, uh, mm -hmm. corporate straight, straight narrative reads. Is that, uh, is that exciting for you, or is that just something, oof, I've got to do it? And, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Are we there yet? Is, is, there, is, is there a character building in that as well, do you think? Well, certainly. Um, it's the same. I, I don't really do much corporate stuff. Now, years ago, I got involved with, I had to get a, a top secret security clearance and all this stuff. We were doing training films for the Army, Navy, and Marines, and it was one of those, you know, this is an S925AB. Mm -hmm. In your civilian life, you probably called it a paintbrush. You know, okay. it was like that, wait, 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 I'm trying to write my name. I mean, it's kind of, you know, fall asleep time. Um, the narrative stuff now, like Alaska State Troopers, I've done uh, Fishermen of the Sea, you know, the, a bunch of those kind of things. Um, it's, it's a narrative style, but again, yeah, you know, again, depending on what it is, like they'll say, no, we want more drama on this, or they're pulling up on a terrible, you know, very graphic, you know, automobile accident, or they're actually chasing a suspect. I mean, a lot of that will come across, but it's the same thing as doing promos. You don't inject that much stuff. Uh, that's what the visual is doing. Yeah. And then otherwise what happens is it comes across as very swarmy. So if you're doing, you know, a promo read and it's talking about, you know, Jill Smith discovered that she had cancer. Okay. We well, are not going to do, Jill Smith discovered that she had cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they won't let you do that. It's like we understand that, but it's more that you, you are there to inform, not really take a side. 
and that's usually the, what they will tell you. So you, you need to kind of pull back a so little. Still bit. understanding the right sort of styles. For the well, sure, exactly. Yeah. It's the same thing as is you know movie trailers. Everybody assumes if you do movie trailers, you have to be hung like Mr. Moose and you have a voice that what knocks yeah. the walls down. And it's like no, there's guys that Reno Romano is phenomenal. Reno's a great guy, and he's and he does you know very very you know what George De Hoyo, a bunch of the higher register stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all. That was an interesting conversation yeah. I had with John Gary last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He was saying to me, uh, I didn't. I, at the time, I hadn't done any promos, and uh, I said I didn't think I could. And he said, "Why not? You haven't tried." So sure. uh, it's finding the right style for your voice. Well, and, and, that, and that's the key. It's like Ashton Smith. Ashton is <coughs> taking over, kind of replaced mm -hmm. Don. And, and Ashton, we always laugh. It's a you know ten second promo, and it's eight seconds is tonight on NBC. It just kind of rolls out there. Well, in that case, you're never going to hear Ashton. Hey, honey, what's for dinner? Yeah. Kraft macaroni and cheese. No, he's, but he's making bazillions doing trailers. He's phenomenal at that. He's got a, that wonderful voice that cuts through and that, that's that niche. That's, he's found what works and that's what he does. Okay, that's very cool. Well, this is, uh, your studios here are amazing, all the, uh, the, the different actors that come through here, the different productions, the range of productions that you do here. Um, and I was just wondering if I could just introduce one new character and see if sure. you could bring a voice through. I, I have uh, a little bear that's been with me for 30 years. Uh, this is Russell. I think um, he needs to get out more. <laughs> yeah, well, he gets out quite a bit. He's, Shut he's up, Russell. They're talking to me. Yeah, it's like, all right. No, okay. Uh, he, he hasn't had a voice for 30 years. <clears throat> okay. Is he, uh, is he an older bear? Is he a sweet bear? I think he's a sweet bear. He's traveled quite a bit. He's quite curious about what he sees around Is he him. a smart bear? Well, what do you mean? Just look at the light coming out of his eyes there. He's a smart bear. I'd be scared as well. <laughs> I love this. Do you want to see my bear? <laughs> Wait a second. How many times has he used this? I have little furry I animals get, in my van. I really. This is the first. Is the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, the, the obvious choice is that you go very sweet and he's quite this, you know, that kind of thing. But I think, let's see, if he's smart, he could be a little more intelligent, what, like scientific kind of? Okay. So that's a possibility, I guess. Hmm, let's see, I guess what kind of voice? I guess he could be very much that kind of feel like that if he wants to go British. We could get him a little more like this and get him maybe even more like this. Or we could get him and drop the accent entirely and just go, I'm so happy to be here today as I'm losing my voice because you can tell I've been speaking all day. I actually had a video game this morning, so I apologize. But he's Marvelous. very, very cute. He is indeed. Well, thanks very much, Mark. But I think we should make him talk like this. Yeah. Hey. I'm just curious. I have a. Could you touch me under my arm? Yeah, that's it. Well, like that. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thanks. It was a pleasure. You're a great guy. I'm so glad you guys came over. It's wonderful to have you here. Welcome to America, you poor man. Now get your contractor's license. Listen to what your mother said. I will do. I will do. <laughs> thanks, Mark. My pleasure. Take care.